right on schedule. Awesome. Maybe you get a couple minutes. Um, <coughs> good morning. I was I have been to the Appalachian Hall of Bluffs and Roots for Beans Preserve one time, a long time ago. I think it's when I still worked on the Appalachian Hall and National Forest, and that was really a long time ago. But uh, so I'm really excited to be here. This building wasn't here then, and it was. Um, it's cool. I'm excited. Uh, it inspired me, actually. I learned lessons I learned from that, my original field tour about what was going on with wiregrass and seed collection and seeding, really inspired me and led me to do some experiments at Fort Gordon uh, and uh, Carolina Santos National Wildlife Refuge. No, no, yeah. And a few other places that just based on direct seeding and doing work on wiregrass. So I just mentioned that because I'm really happy to be here, but also to mention a little bit about my history. I am going to talk to you about a project I'm involved in now, but that's, it, it's a, a very narrow part of what I've done in terms of restoration. I, I started work um, doing a lot of work with, um, in Sand Hills in uh, South Carolina and uh, focused on some work about wiregrass and, and fire and seed production and seed viability. Moved on, and since then I've done some silvicultural related projects about t t figuring out ways to regenerate longleaf without cutting down that off-site log lolly altogether. So this kind of underplanting and gradual conversion. And that involved uh, sites other than sand hills. So I've also worked in some of these flatwood sites and some warm music and wet sites. So I'm really interested in the work that's going on in restoration there. We did some understory work in those sites. So I have a little experience there just to give you some background. But I've always been interested, ever since I was a graduate student, I was interested in uh, ecological genetics. So that has led me to this, I've been able to come around and actually do some work with that and think about um, how uh, populations of plants differ and how that influences or the potential outcomes of restorations. We really, our goals are good, positive, reliable outcomes for restoration efforts. And a lot of that is related to the suitability of the plant materials that we put there. So I'm going to be talking about sourcing uh, plant materials. I'm going to talk specifically about a project that we have going on in South Carolina. In some ways it's a pilot study because it is so localized in South Carolina, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But we have aspirations. We have ex expanded some of it to the, the entire range of the longleaf, the longleaf ecosystem. And we have sort of goals set out for looking at some broader pictures, because that's what we really need. So with that introduction, um, oh, let me also mention that I would be remiss in saying, not mentioning that I do work for the Southern Research Station of the US Forest Service. I'm located at Clemson University. And I'm associated with the Research Working Net, whose mission is the conservation and, well, the restoration and management of the long pine ecosystem across, across the range. So, I hate these things. <laughs> see, what, where do we? Is that a board? No. Let's do this one. Um, of course, you're all familiar with uh, the need and the broad interest in the restoration of the long pine ecosystem. Long, broad partnerships. Uh, Brian mentioned the America's Long Research in the Restoration Initiative, and how um, that there is that that there's work going on across the region, and it's really been a productive. And I was very pleased to hear that you got the language changed to increase uh, emphasis on the ground layer. That's been something that. I was involved in that at the beginning, at the development of that plan, when a bunch of people got together and identified, at least in part, some of the issues that limited our ability to reach those regional goals of restoration. And one of those limiting factors was the availability of local seed or native seed for understory restoration, as well as the need to develop reliable methods for restoration. So, it and that, that keys into a re really recent paper that was published by um, Miller et al. in Eco Restoration Ecology when he, they, they made the observation that what 
restoration ecologists really need to work with restoration practitioners. Restoration science is fun, it's great, it's good, but unless it's actually serving the restoration community, we're really missing the boat. So the failure to, uh, to meet restoration goals is in part the responsibility of researchers, which sometimes researchers get off and, and don't actually own that responsibility. But in that, that synthesis, they identified these five regions or five they organize the questions needed for practical restoration or uh, where there is a, a meeting of restoration management while research and practice. practice. And um, the one that I'm really interested in, there are questions around how do you set targets and make plans. There are questions about sourcing material, which is the area in which I'm working. But it's an interesting uh, synthesis if you ever are interested in looking at, um, if, you, if you look at Restoration Ecology, I, I would rec recommend looking at that. It's a good updated um, kind of review of what we don't know or know. So um, in that paper, they also identified some specific <coughs> questions. And I know if you sat around and you thought about this, and in conversation, we can come up with these same questions. What are the issues related to plant sourcing that we need to consider in uh, planning understory restoration projects. Now, this is only part of the list, but for example, you might first start out to ask, do you really need to introduce plant materials, or are there enough on site? Can we treat that land in a way that we can um, bolster those local populations? Um, so that would be passive regeneration. Um, the question I'm really focused on has to do with uh, from where should biological, biological material be sourced? to minimize negative impacts, and the kind of impacts might, that might be negative might be the loss of genetic diversity through like cryptic invasion or the loss of the, the, the risk that a species or a genotype that you bring into that system might be so successful that it swamps out any native genotypes that are there. That's been termed cryptic invasion. Or um, other sort of genetic consequences uh, like outbreeding depression, another story. But then there are the more other questions like, is it better to mix genotypes? That whole question about, should I just take my seeds from one place or should I take them from a whole bunch of places and mix them together because I'll get better diversity? And, and um, so these are the kinds of questions that really do need to be considered when we make these decisions about I'm bringing seeds in from somewhere or as a distributor of seeds, should I allow my seeds to be moved? Uh, from here to South Carolina, for example. So today, uh, I'm going to share with you the development of what we call the South Carolina Common Garden Study, as a case study of how to do this kind of work, as well as share some of the results that we found and where it's leading us. As part of this, I'll uh, share with you how we thought about setting up this garden. And these are the kinds of tasks and questions that need to be accomplished. And some, if you're working around with the reserve, you've probably already encountered some of these things. Um, and I'm going to talk about the factors that need to be considered in, in answering these questions, how we actually solve the problems, and uh, if we had to do over what we might change, because there's always those good things, and uh, provide some of our results. And finally, to, to talk about what going forward, how do we expand our efforts or where are additional efforts needed. So the, the need for ecologically suitable plant materials, um, so ecologically suitable means our goals are to have plant materials that will thrive in the new restoration project. Also, these plant materials should be ones that don't threaten any of the biodiversity that's there. That is, it helps to conserve genetic resources. And finally, we're interested in functional traits. Uh, how, does, how do these plant, introduced plants function? Um, the traits of interest that we might uh, use to assess how well they're doing are those that affect the capacity to establish from seed and restoration projects. So the safe solution, if I were to ask you, you know, what's, what's the best way to do this? And the common knowledge is you take local seed from the, the closest possible locations 
and match them in a, phys a site that physically matched the target sites. And that's kind of the local is best approach. And that's based on the notion of it's really rooted in local adaptation, that plants are adapted to where they grow, and if you move them too far, then perhaps they won't thrive, or they may be even maladapted. Um, this approach may minimize the risk of getting poorly adapted species, but it provides no guidance for seed sources of wider distribution. So if you were, and this pr approach may be really useful, if there are sites that are local nearby and you can collect seed from, that's all well and good. Um, it, it also might work if you have smaller sites where the demand for seed isn't so great and that you can plan well in advance. Um, you don't want to have to be, it. smaller sites would require the collection of less seed, therefore a less negative impact on those last remaining good sites. But as we increase our efforts in the interest in restoration, there's the potential for increasing demand for seed um, and some stockpiling of seeds for larger projects. This would be um, related to then perhaps support the need for the development of a local uh, native plant industry for production of seed. Um, there's a lot of reasons why this makes sense, but it's not the only way to go. There is also then the need to question is, are there places where local may not be best? So there have been, in recent, recent years, some alternative thoughts about how you might source seeds. And the first one will start at the top, and this will be sort of a gradient from um, the, the emphasis on local seeds to something where seed source doesn't matter. Uh, local seeds would be genetically matched to the locally adapted, and that's the local is best approach, and that might be really important for a site with high existing biological integrity where you want to uh, enrich populations, uh, or where the, the ecological conservation value is high. And as we, then we might consider a version called a relaxed, where you could focus on ecological matching and avoiding small populations, so you, you don't limit the evolutionary potential. In this case, you might be selecting from a, a number of nearby populations if you don't have enough from a single population. And as we sort of produce, continue, continue down this gradient, um, we might, some have, a, another approach has been described as a composite approach, composite prov prov provenancing, um, which increases evolutionary potential, but you would add maybe a few non-local genotypes just to like hedge your bets for genetic diversity. Um, another approach, even more, adding more from further afield to maximize evolutionary potential. And then you slip into something where for highly cultivated, highly modified sites where highly altered uh, soil, top soil has been removed. Maybe you want to even select something as way off the mark as a highly productive cultivar. Doesn't sound like restoration, but it does imp it perhaps starts to restore function to a site that otherwise um, is pretty hopeless. Another in the lexicon of provenancing is this, this notion that we need to select seed that fit the future. As we're a focus on climate change and a world that's changing, the environment that from where we get our seeds might not be the appropriate environment for seeds that are going to be uh, producing and growing into the future. That may be more important for long-lived species like trees, um, where shorter-lived species, or herbaceous perennials, um, tend to change and adapt more quickly because their life spans are shorter. And finally, then, just this notion, again, of accommodating functionality rather than nativeness, that um, it really doesn't matter where you get the seeds from. Let's just put them out there and see what happens if you're really interested in function. So all of this, this approach is, is this gradient of, of adding, um, reducing specificity and increasing evolutionary potential, in, in a sense. 
Um, it's also how you would choose among these is really dependent on your goals. Um, the need for specificity might be greater if you have rare plants or highly specialized plants of specialized habitats. It may be greater if you have a high quality environment you're trying to preserve. And it may be less specific as you're going to more degraded sites. So it's highly dependent uh, and contingent on what you're trying to preserve and where uh, and the conditions that you're starting out with. But let's return to the safe solution, the local is best solution. Um, as I mentioned, this, this is a system that works, it's been the preferred, and it is the go-to solution in terms of conservative for, for gene conservation, for <coughs> gene conservation perspective. Um, but it does have its limitations in terms of being able to serve larger communities. If you are a company that's trying to develop some um, source identified seed that you can sell, ideally you would want to have some seed that is, can be sold over a larger geographic region. So you could say, my seed is good for the entire state of Florida plus South Georgia. Or rather than saying my seed is only good in the Apalachicola um, for beans and gloves preserved. So there's this trade-off, um, conservation-wise, we might opt for smaller recommendations, but if we are serving, uh, trying to serve greater needs, this need for a license to move seeds further, or some way to say, my seed is good, some way to guarantee that would be, um, uh, would be the desire of um, a, a, a developing an industry. So there's trade-offs about how to go here. One approach for saying, for figuring out how far you can move seeds is really based on this local is better approach, which is then based on local adaptation matters. That's the genetic connection. Um, is to build generalized seed zones. And if you're gardeners, you've probably seen the plant hardiness zone map for USDA, you see like zone 7 and zone 10 and you can plant your plants. And that's all climate based, but that's one version of information about how, where, where it's suitable for, to put plants and they will survive. So it's climate driven and that is one driver of where, where plants will survive. So some models have been proposed that say don't move outside of these regions. Um, recognizing that climate isn't the only factor that affects the success of plants, folks, some people have uh, recommended using ecoregions, which synthesize a lot of ecological information, geological history, soils, topography, climate variables, to, to suggest that um, these, in, in different colors here, would be have more uniform conditions, and perhaps all the seed collected in the blue might be suitable to move within the blue, as long as you're within like the longleaf range. This green map, this green line, by the way, is the historic range of longleaf pine. So you can see that in the southeast, these there are a bunch of ecoregions represented in the longleaf pine system, and some have suggested that ecoregions may be the guiding guiding principle. But in that case, if you look at that, a seed grown in South Georgia would be suitable for planting like, over much of the long leaf range. And I, I'm not, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and we have some, well, I would question that um, for, for a couple of reasons. For one, there are these gradients in climate and they, they are apparently starting to matter. Um, I'll get to some results from our study. Um, Another proposal has been to refine these general ecoregion type maps, and there's a variety of ecoregion classifications. But to, to refine those maps, this was published by Bauer et al. 2014 that says, okay, these, this was climate based originally, it was overlaying with ecoregions, and uh, to come up with these seed or 
plant material transfer zones, again, shown in different colors. And the lines embedded in them, these smaller lines, are, are one nested, more refined ecoregion classification. They say, so they hedge their bets. They, so they say, ecoregions are the way to go. Because out west, they seem to work. This has been tested in western systems a lot more than in eastern systems, and focused on woody plants and not on herbaceous plants. So within the Forest Service and maybe other uh, federal circles, this model has been is being pushed as being the right model. So let's use eco regions, but you might have to refine them, tweak them here and there for habitat. So there's a lot of hedging going on. But nevertheless, this model is out there. I think it's a good starting point. And um, if we were um, in South Carolina, in South Carolina, we would be looking at basically two eco regions or two seed transfer zones related to. Um, so this is, here is South Carolina, and in the Longleaf Range, which is this, this line, the green line, we would be looking at basically two ecoregions. And the study that we set up to do, or the garden study that I'm um, building up to here, is uh, really to, was designed to test or ultimately to test the applicability of some of these general models uh, to the success or to use as guidelines for transferring the seed and plant materials of perennials in the long leaf <coughs> ground layer. So we started out uh, one way, let me just go up a minute. One way to test this is to uh, use to test the applicability of a model would be to sample populations from these different eco or these different proposed uh, seed zones, put them all together in a common garden and see how they perform. Ideally, we would have a common garden or two in each of those eco regions to see if plants from a particular eco region have a home site advantage. Um, and so essentially, that's what we did with our study. And by necessity, it was a fairly small-scale study, but let me go on to explain that. Um, probably, you are all, the design of our garden and our garden study was really driven by some things about the Longleaf Pine ecosystem. So essentially, it has a broad geographic extent, which you all know, and as shown on this map. Um, there, it, the local variation is subtle, but it does control diversity patterns locally. Um, soil texture in particular, uh, can be, but it's related to soil types, nutrient availability, and nutrient status. Um, regionally, there are these large ecoregions which suggest variation. So, um, physically, it's an open pine canopy, the ground layer is very diverse, and fire is really important. So these are all basic concepts, and these actually apply across the Long Beach region. But in designing our common garden experiment, we took these into consideration in, this, in the following ways. Um, the broad geographic extent with species turnover, so there's species, similar species in South Carolina as might be in Florida, but the exact similar taxa, but the species might be different. The functions might be similar. So there's a turnover, a change across the ecosystem. Um, we decided to account for this geographic extent, which we would never be able to put in one garden with the resources that we had at the time. We would limit the extent to South Carolina. The local drivers of composition are soil moisture and nutrients, we would select a part of the environmental gradient. And in this case, it was sort of dry to dry music part of the environmental gradient that we, populations that we sample. We would sample dominant plant families. So we included grasses, legumes, and composites in our study. Um, we recognize that there's high diversity and rare species in this system, and that's important. In this, this we interpret that it, it, it highlights the importance of getting our decisions right but we did not include rare species in our garden study. Most species are perennial. Seedling establishment is rare. So we wanted to 
when we were going to measure our plants in the garden, we would be focusing on competitive advantage, stress tolerance, and the ability to recover from fire. So these are things that we needed to be successful for uh, if it was going to be an acceptable population. <coughs> and we recognized that fire may be needed for flowering and seed production, so we really asked the question, do we need to burn this garden? So these are, these were the, um, these were the ecosystem, how the ecosystem drove the development of this garden project. So I want to step back and look at this notion of biogeographic considerations. Um, as I pointed out, some of those general models, they were based on physical environment and strongly driven by climate. But in the southeast, it's pretty different. Uh, there are high areas of endemism throughout the Longleaf Pine Range. It's known for that. Um, that, that contributes to some of the species turnover from the Atlantic Coastal Plain to the Gulf Coastal Plain. But there are not, it's not just species turnover, but there's high area, areas where there are concentrations of local, narrow, narrowly endemic species. These are sort of contour maps indicating high numbers of endemism. This would be um, the, the ridge in central Florida. This is the Apalachicola region right here. Um, and the Middle Atlantic Coastal Plain also has some narrow endemics. And narrow endemics come about um, through sort of evolutionary pressures. They can be developed because populations are isolated, that they are um, in places where evolution happens quickly. But all of those factors that allow for the evolution of narrow endemics also were affecting the common species around them at the time. So there's some idea or suggestion that maybe there is genetic diversity um, that could be, we could get some hints about that genetic diversity uh, among common species if there is this common, similar evolutionary isolation and pressure. So we were, uh, this was with George Hernandez, who's a colleague of mine in Region 8, um, with the Forest Service, we, we thought about this, that we were just kind of bristling at the fact that the Western people thought that the Western models worked everywhere. And we said, but, but no, I mean, we're different here. We have a different phytogeographical history, a different evolutionary history. And that was just one piece of that evidence. So we asked the question, do patterns of endemism, is it possible that they could provide information that, that would inform the development of seed transfer zones, like where is it safe to move seeds around. So coupled with that, recommend, that recognition that there's species turnover across the range, we went seeking a different model. Not only did we want to test the model that the climate-based models and ecoregion models, but we wanted to, to think about some other ideas, like the importance of phytogeography. So this is another way of looking at endemic patterns in the southeast. These colors represent zones that were identified by Sorian Weekly in a paper from 2001. And there's a whole bunch of different endemic patterns throughout. This is just a few of them from that paper. But you can see that um, the whole longleaf range really has a whole bunch of endemic species. Um, at smaller scales, we see that in South Carolina, there's a couple overlaps of um, different areas of endemism. Um, so South Carolina, and, and the, on the Atlantic Coast Plain. So why I focus on South Carolina be, uh, for, this is spinning, because that's where we were working. And another just sort of example of where there's species disjunctions that might be meaningful, it splits South Carolina right down the middle. And it was re we were, there was this real concern at the time when we started this project about this division. And this is notoriously where northern wiregrass separates from southern wiregrass. You may have heard that taxonomic story. The wiregrass gap is right through the middle of South Carolina. And we were, we were thinking as a collective group, um, we were uh, concerned about native plant restoration and conservation. Uh, it does one seed source for South Carolina make sense? Can we actually do that? In the face of this evidence, 
we were really not sure. So um, we uh, continued to look around for models that regionalized the southeast and, came, and looked at the biodiversity, the ecoregion model that TNC uses for biodiversity conservation. And lo and behold, it actually recognizes this split in South Carolina um, with the Middle Atlantic and South Atlantic Coastal Plain divisions, um, which we thought, okay, that's an alternative model for seed distribution. Maybe in South Carolina we really do need to pay attention to that bio, biogeographic boundary. Um, this map also shows this little fringe of gray speckled stuff, though it doesn't look like gray speckled on the screen. That's the sandhills. And so the sandhills have a different uh, evolutionary history. They're older. Um, they may have provided refugia during glacial times or carried glacial times for some of the species. When I was working the sandhills, um, one of the coastal plain guys, I mean, I, I had spent my, my background working in the outer coastal plain in species-rich savannas down near the coast, and I always thought that was really cool. But someone pointed out to me that all the species that I cared about came from the sandhills, um, from yeah, coast glaciers. So I said, oh, okay, so all of a sudden the sandhills became really interesting. And um, <laughs> more interesting. And uh, the, the, um, the, so there's, there was a geological history, as well as, as, well as some eco-regional sort of soils, and climate. And another point, in South Carolina, the sandhills are always the hottest and driest places in the state. Regardless, I mean, they're not on the coast, they're not on the mountains, they are the hottest and driest places in the state. So there are, there were uh, physical, environmental differences. So we wanted to recognize, in our study, um, three general regions. Uh, Middle Atlantic Coastal Plain in blue, uh, South Atlantic Coastal Plain, and the sandhills, thinking that they might drive variations in populations. Um, okay, so uh, we decided to look at that variation, use that as a model for stratifying our population sampling, and also then to assess, is this a good model to guide the, the distribution of plant materials for restoration? Uh, the general tasks for setting up a garden study are really huge. We didn't know that when we started, ignorance was bliss, but uh, you need to have a plan. And these are the kinds of questions that you need to, to, design, to ask. Which populations and how many are you, are you going to collect from across the range, put them in the same garden and see how they grow? Uh, so which populations and how many? Which species? Are you just going to look at one? Or But species are so different. And there are reasons that um, the, the, the performance of species might vary because of like, their breeding system, their fragmentation history, um, the, the uh, migration history, post-glaciation. There's a lot of reasons why species for species, they might differ, but particularly uh, breeding system. Um, so, seed collection questions. Who's going to do it? How do you, have you need to do it with the same protocols? How many? How do you distribute the seeds? So these are all the kind of questions that <coughs> if you are seeking seeds, for a project, um, you would ask these questions if you were collecting your own seeds. But you also might want to, want to be wary of who did the collection and where they came from if you're buying seeds. How will you clean the seed? How will you produce materials for the garden? Are you going to start plant seeds in the garden? Where will the gardens be? How many of them? All those kinds of questions. And then, not last but not least, are what traits will be measured? How will you measure whether this population is a better performer than another one? And why does it matter? So these are all questions that we've considered. And I'll share a little bit about how we decided and what we decided. Um, so first of all, again, as I mentioned, we were cons concerned about those three general regions, the sand hills and two uh, north and middle Atlantic coastal plain and south Atlantic coastal plain. We had seed collections um, that if we consider the provisional seed zones that were, that were published in 2014, we also had both of those pretty well represented. These red dots indicate where we had collections. These were not, every species was not collected in every one of these dots. But these represent where we had any collections of any of the seven species we put into the garden. We focused our collections on 
public lands or lands that at least we knew the burn history and that we had access to. So we couldn't just go out anywhere that we wanted to. We, we really had to like contact land managers and find out when C would be available. Um, we decided on about 10 populations per species per uh, per species, and those were distributed among those three um, geographical units. Regarding which species, we as a group, this was again a South Carolina interagency, private uh, conservation, NGOs, we got together and said what, what do we care about? What species do we want to learn about? And there was a concern that we wanted species. There was ultimately a concern to support the development of a native plant nursery. So we really wanted species that would have wide value, um, ultimately. Rare species, not so much. So we were focusing on common species. We considered ecological market and production values or costs. Um, the kinds of things are on this table. Were they uh, common? Do they represent the dominant groups? Did they provide, could they provide fuel? Did they have wildlife value, um, pollinator support function? Um, and are they representative? They couldn't be weeds. They had to be ones that would be con con conservative species from an ecological point of view. Um, to appeal to who might buy these seeds if somewhere down the line we could actually end up producing them. Um, wildlife managers, fuel management, floral display, all of those had appeal for market value. But we also were concerned about growing these seeds out and being able to put them into garden as well as the growth and development for other people who wanted to put these seeds out. So um, we considered the habitat breadth, we considered the ease of growing, the ease of collection, how available were these seeds. So we, we went through this, this, um, this question uh, or we had about 80 species originally on the list. We, we polled our constituents and said, you know, what do you think are important? And we created this matrix, and I call it the yes, no, maybe matrix. And, um, and this is pretty much what we did. We had the species, we had to fit, we just identified the taxonomic group, did it provide any of those values. And when we whittled it all down, uh, it, it some, at some point it came down to can we get these species when we were ready to set it up. But they also had to meet the other criteria. This is just a portion of that matrix. So it was very much a collective decision about how to, to set it up. Um, these are the species we ended up putting in our common garden. There are three grasses, a little blue stem, um, uh, Elliot's uh, Indian grass and wire grass. We collected both northern wire grass and southern wire grass because they, they're both in South Carolina and across that gap. So I just, this is a picture of Aristida stripta, but we also had Aristida bayrickiana in our garden and we kept the data collection and everything separate there. Um, we had Pityopsis grimmanifolia, uh, Anna's scented. Uh, goldenrod, Solidago odora, two legumes, Lespedisa capitata and Tephrosia virginiana. Um, we just went with it. If we started over, maybe I would change some, but this is what we went with. And, and uh, I, well, I can comment on all of them, will to some extent. We set up seed collection and storage um, criteria. We would have at least 50 plants per population. We wanted to, to collect from large populations which might be genetically diverse. Um, this number is arbitrary. It came from a bunch of papers, um, but there's no really good reason for this. That's one of the unknowns that we need to understand better. We collected across the population, we collected seeds that were ready to be dispersed, so they were ripe. We didn't have the storage um, dorm dormancy, minimized dormancy questions. Uh, we collected all the mature and dispersing seeds from each plant, and we put all the seeds from one population into a bag and mixed them. If I had it to do over, I would have kept them separate. That's another, another consideration. We still have a way of understanding population variation. What we're not sure about is maybe some really productive plants were overrepresented. So, 
a detail. <laughs> we collected some data when we, when we got the plants, like where it came from, the date, habitat knows, was it sand hills, was it flatwoods, was it, was it recently burned, what's the burn history, as much as we could accumulate. And we just kept them in uh, paper bags in a dry shed at field temperatures. We had no humidity control. Fortunately, the seeds are pretty tolerant of all that. We had the assistance of the National Seed Lab for uh, cleaning and testing. They gave us some x-ray assessments of um, filled seed, whether the seed has the potential, whether it has an embryo in it. Um, they provided data on purity and seeds per pound, pure live seed. Uh, we found, based on this, that variability, viability varied among populations. It was associated with ecoregions, but we did not test that. And that's another thing I would go back and do again, and I'm proposing to have a student recollect some of these populations and actually do that testing. Now, I, I know they did, there was a, a sort of sister study that was set up that went across the Gulf Coast. And based on viability and germination at three different locations, there was not variation east-west. That's just, I don't know the details of that. I know that that was reported. Um, and we use those results to figure out how many seeds to put into each little pot when we planted it, to each planting cell. So if 50% of the seeds were viable and we wanted one live seed at the end, one live plant at least, we would put four or five seeds in it. We would get a couple of seedlings and weed it down to a single seedling. We germinated all our plants, and we grew all of our plants in the greenhouse in the same kind of growing cells that lumpy pine seedlings are grown in, from in, in many nurseries. Germinated them in there, we thinned them to a single plant. They were grown in a, in a greenhouse at Clemson University for about eight weeks under natural light that was supplemented, um, cloudy days. And we fertilized them just once, or very lightly with the slow release fertilizer, because that's really <coughs> It's really one of the challenges of growing plants in this system is that they are, they don't require a lot of nutrients and I think some, some horticulturists, I mean that's, that's not what they teach their students, they want to maximize growth and make beautiful plants for Christmas. Um, one of the side studies that we did, we're concerned about, was trying to get all the seeds to germinate at the same time because um, in particular legumes can, they have some, they have hard, coat, hard seed coats and the breakdown of those seed coats is required to get germination. In nature, that happens over time. And we wanted to make it happen all at once. So we did some experiments with hot water, scarifying the seeds with sandpaper, or nicking that seed coat with a razor blade. And we ended up scarifying them with sandpaper to sort of to try to uh, synchronize uh, germination, which worked pretty well. It's just a little side an extra needed, something that we did. So these are plants um, in our greenhouse. This is Tephrosia. That's my colleague Shauna planting away. <clears throat> and we had some special things that we had to do. We really needed to maximize air moving around because we found the legumes in particular were susceptible to um, damping off. And it was there was a lot of things we learned. We had two greenhouses this size. Now, just to give you an idea, I mean, you maybe some of you have grown plants, but we we really ignorance really was bliss, I guess, because um, we ended up growing thousands and thousands of plants of all these different species with different requirements, and none of us had any greenhouse culture experience. Um, we didn't. There's a lot of just a lot of things we didn't know. So. We learned a lot, and we had a lot of help from the greenhouse staff there. Um, but we had some false starts. We had to replant wiregrass, for example. And we never had wiregrass failures before. And I have no idea why it failed the first time we planted it. And we, I said we never had wiregrass failures before. And it was, it was probably something in the greenhouse. And we, we ended up planting it a year later because we had to start over. And we still haven't figured that one out. This is the kind of sequencing that went on. Um, we had collection sowing, out planting, and on the other side you see the age and months of seedlings that we planted out. Um, and so the seedlings ranged in age from three months to nine months when we actually put them in the ground. We collected um, in the fall or late summer, whenever the seeds were ripe in 2010, 
through 2012, depending on the species. Um, we planted them soon after we got them, or in the early spring, and we outplanted them in the, in the spring. Not always the best time. Sometimes it was bordering on dry seasons. Um, I've, the first plant we put in the ground was sorgastrum, I believe. Yeah, that's about, that's about right. And, but we put it out when the seedlings were really young. They had like two or three pillars. Big mistake. I would have waited. And I think we had some early on mortality. I think it was just related to planting plants out that were too small, but we were so hopeful. They looked so good in the greenhouse. Um, but we planted them in the deep sands. Um, we planted them at, well, I'll show you the locations in a minute. That's the next question. You say, well, where are we going to have these gardens to maximize information? So if you have one garden, you can figure out differences among populations um, without accounting for <coughs> environmental variation like in their local populations. You can't compare them where they grow and got put them together. Um, so it makes it possible to evaluate differences and to see if those populations are actually different based on where they came from. Um, but it's not necessarily tells you anything about local adaptation because everybody's not in their best place. In multiple gardens, it, it approximates a, a reciprocal transplant study. That meaning you take all the populations and put them in everybody else's home court, and you see who does best. But if, so that if populations are adapted to local conditions, if there's local adaptation um, that they acquire through time, then from individuals who perform better in a garden that, that's closest to their local environment and not as well as in in environments that are different. So that allows us to tell us something if there's some actual ad local adaptations that we might need to consider for restoration. Um, again, if there's no adaptation or populations are totally adaptable, then the performance will not differ from location to location. So we wanted to locate gardens to represent a range of collection sites. So we, we chose to plant three of these gardens with seven species with hundreds of individuals. Um, and so not only were we contending with growing a lot of plants, but getting to these three locations around the state at the right time. Um, lower coastal plain, South Atlantic, or um, South Atlantic coastal plain, uh, Middle Atlantic coastal plain, a garden in Charleston, a garden in Columbia, which is good sand hills, and Middle Atlantic coastal plain uh, near Florence. These were all located on Sand Hill, on research and education centers that are owned and managed by Clemson University. Great partners. They helped us out a lot with this project. Um, we had, we blocked our species to account for any variation in these gardens. We planted them in rows to be more efficient. So we had about 30 plants per population in each garden. Uh, 10 to 14 populations, so you do all the math and you get you know, 7,000, 8,000 plants, all to go on the ground at the right time. And, you know, this is the, the confession. That I would have started with three species and one garden, maybe three gardens. <laughs> so if you're actually interested in, in supporting a project like this, there's, there's a lot of things to think about. This is what the garden looks like. Uh, this is the garden at Sand Hills Research and Education Center near Columbia. This is our wire grass. We planted them in, in rows across this landscape fabric, and everything in the same row came from the same population. <coughs> um, we planted six blocks randomized. Um, this is a Lespedeza late in the season. You see in the far back the yellow haze is a Saladego. The one in the front of that is the Pityopsis. Um, so these were not tilled. We put down landscape fabric based on a previous study. Um, that we that showed that that was a better way to get plants up and growing rather than tilling and trying to control weeds otherwise. And this was a garden. We weren't trying to do anything natural or or you know it was it was clearly a, a research endeavor. So um, just another little technical difficulty: cutting holes in landscape fabric. Have you ever done it? It's a pain. Um, so. TJ, this is TJ Savarino. He's our um, extension specialist uh, partner at Clemson. He found this really cool torch that cut holes, that melted holes just the right size to plant into. So that was really facilitated planting. The downside of it was, though, 
And these plants grew really big. So every year we went in with a box cutter or a knife and we were just making these holes bigger and bigger. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's really satisfying. We've learned quite a bit. Um, so data collection, those are the, the timing again. In data collection, um, we, have, we had three gardens uh, for two years. And we abandoned two of those for a couple of reasons. One of them at Charleston, this, there was so much rain, the soils were so fine textured. They were just too good for wiregrass understory plants. Even though these probably were longleaf systems, they had been used in the past agriculturally, and those plants just grew like monsters, and they kind of killed themselves. They blew over, they, they, they didn't look right either. So we do have data about the performance of plants in all three of those gardens for two seasons, two growing seasons. For two gardens, we have three growing seasons worth of data, and then the manager at one of the sites needed to convert that back to production agriculture. We could not get him to see the light. Um, so we are now down to one garden, which is at the Sand Hills Research and Education Center. And it's actually one of the best sites. Uh, this, this plants do really well there. It is a little tough maybe on the legumes because they tend to prefer a little finer textured soil and a little bit of maybe phosphorus or loaminess. So we keep an eye on them, but so far they're holding their own. And the, the sort of final set of questions are, what do you measure when you put all these plants in the garden? And we wanted to measure characteristics that were related to their fitness. How well are they going to do? Um, so we had uh, traits that were related to phenology, the timing of when they grew in the spring or when they died back. This is related to availability for pollinators or even relative to when typical burn seasons are. We looked at reproduction uh, variables, how fast do they grow, and some, some elements of physiology. That's the, that was the proposed master list of traits that we measured. And we did a bunch of these. We didn't get them all done. And we didn't get them all done uniformly, but we have enough multiple performance traits that we can start to look at, are, is performance related to geography? So does it, do these populations that came from one place differ from populations that came from another place? We had a sampling plan that identified when to sample it, how many times we would sample it, just to try to keep us on track. Sort of worked. <laughs> um, so I'll share with you some results. We haven't done the multivariate sort of grouping everything together to look at if you take all these traits in common, um, how different are populations from each other. But we have some isolated traits to look at There's, that are interesting. Now remember, this is only a small piece of the Long Leaf Range. This is the, the breadth, the length and breadth of South Carolina, more or less. We collected a little bit into Georgia, down at Fort Stewart and a little bit into North Carolina, as far north as the Croatan National Forest. But for the most part, it's a pretty small, isolated part of the long range. We did find, we looked at the phenology of Solidago, and we found, uh, we had, in this particular study garden, there were only there were nine populations represented. Four of them from the, from the north and five from the south. Um, we found out that Three of the populations started the flower in mid-July. This is a picture in July that shows one of the populations going across there, beginning to flower, and everything else is green. Um, at that same time, um, some of the populations were vegetation only, and others in the middle were uh, starting to show buds turning yellow, sort of developmental. And what we found is that the advanced populations were all the northern populations, uh, the least advanced were all the southern populations, and the ones in the middle were the ones in the middle. <laughs> and that, I mean, that actually is significant because they are, that's such a small piece of the range. And it matters in terms of um, the length of the growing season that is available for these plants to produce seeds. If, in the south, if you're a late bloomer, it's okay because the growing season is very long. Plenty of time to produce seeds, disperse seeds. If you're in the north, the growing season is shorter. So this difference makes sense, even over that short geographic range. 
So maybe there's not east-west differences, but maybe there are north-south south differences in the range that we need to accommodate. And that's, that has been found for some other species, not southeastern species. So we also looked at the difference between Arista and Stricta and southern and northern wiregrass. And there was a significant difference in how much effort went into reproduction. Um, southern populations made more flowers, more seeds, more biomass per unit size than northern populations. I'm not sure what that means. They're different is what it means. Uh, and the genetics don't necessarily show how different they are, but part of the genetics, this is work that was previously done, uh, was done using older techniques. And um, newer um, sequencing techniques may give us a little more insight. But what this tells us is that it's important to keep those two separate because there are some real differences in terms of functionality. Not in terms of ecosystem function, meaning they all carry fire, but in terms of how they're likely to survive and reproduce and persist in a landscape. Some things were not geographically related, like seed size in Les Um But all the populations were quite variable, and the highest ones were different from the lowest ones, not related to geography. But what this tells us is that populations are different. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell us that it's adaptive or that it's predictive based on geography. But what it can tell us, remind us, is that some populations may be better sources for uh, stressful environments. Like if there are populations that produce a lot of robust seeds with big seedlings, you might want to choose seeds there in a site for a site where conditions are stress, more stressful and harder to get established. Um, early growth rates, there were no geographic patterns. We had the the only frost in 2017, the winter of 2016-2017, occurred in March. Everything was up and growing. You know, you have a garden long enough, you see stuff. Uh, everything died. Um, this died back. And so we had pre-frost pre measurements and post-frost measurements. We were interested in, are some better able to respond to that kind of insult, that sort of climate-based insult? And what we found out was that the response was pretty similar. Bigger plants were bigger after frost, and it didn't matter between northern and southern plants. Um, which is, um, that's good. That's, that's something that at least they should be equally <coughs> able to respond to those, those kind of unexpected stressors early in the season. The last little piece to share is this recognition that this underlying variation, we, we did see populations differ, but the underlying variation is a function of, of genetic structure and genetic diversity. And you can't get around it, you really got to look at it directly. Um, there have been advances in techniques about how to look at it and the kind of information that we can get about genetics now that, that we didn't have 20 years ago. Um, so we have recruited a graduate student, uh, his name's Jason Joins, and he is looking at the genetic structure of Tephrosia virginiana. We selected that one partly because it's a really pretty plant, it's nice to work on, I like it. Um, but it, it also has a specialized pollinator relationship. It's not, it's not wind pollinated, it's not pollinated <coughs> just by any uh, set of wide diversity of organisms, but it has a more uh, strict breeding system and pollinator system. So we figured if there's going to be variation, that would be a good place to find it. Um, he expanded his collection, not just in South Carolina or Georgia or North Carolina, but across the range of Columbia. And we're in the middle of analyzing those data right now. Now we would expect that um, there is genetic variation that's associated with geography. And that just happens. It doesn't necessarily mean they're, they have adaptive significance. But we would expect variation just because of genetic drift or founding population or just being apart long enough um, that you might get sort of these neutral changes that don't affect performance. So we expect that kind of variation, um, but it's important to make the link to function. So Jason, had, I have the results of our preliminary study, which was just the analysis of plants in our garden. So this is the Georgia to North Carolina collections. And um, he looked at 12 populations and 46 individuals, um, used genetic by sequencing methods. Um, these libraries, this, this method includes uh, identifying SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, 
and then looking at the, the similarity among individuals based on all of these little pieces of the genome. Those, um, these are the, po the locations of the populations that were in his study, some in the Sandhills and, and three other lo two other uh, regions. This is the total range of diffrosion. This is not uncommon for the understory plants and longleaf pine ecosystem. Lots of, lots of them are found throughout the Midwest and upper Midwest and into prairie systems. So, whereas some of these species have been made available commercially, they may have come from um, Minnesota or Wisconsin or East Texas. And there's a lot of, I mean, I'm a little cons not too surprised if something from South Texas doesn't do well in South Carolina. Um, so these are the kinds of tests that he did on these uh, 12 populations. Um, this is a funny graph. I, I didn't make it, but I will share it with you. <laughs> um, this is the geographic distance, how far apart populations are. And this is the ge genetic difference, which measures how different they are. <coughs> Each of these little dots here is the distribution of... Um, it shows, well, I'll just get to the bottom, is that there's, there's a distribution here of all these little points in the background. And they show that the similarity the increase, or decreases, so this is distance, or dissimilarity, it increases with distance, which is exactly what we would expect. This is a density cloud. And if these were differences were all driven by the same thing, you would expect this to be the same across. <coughs> So orange would go the whole way and yellow would be on the outside. Because there are some disjunctions, it's not that way here and here, it suggests that there are some other things besides distance that's driving this variation in the, in the genome. And I'm sorry I can't explain it any better than that. But there was a, we did an analysis of a molecular variation, and this separates the variance that's associated among those three regions, the north, the south, and the sandhills, among sites within ecoregions, and then among individuals. This turns out to be the random um, variance, uh, a random error term in the model, so we really can't assess its significance. But both of these values were significant. So there's, there's um, significant differences at this value, so pretty high levels, that there were differences among those ecoregions and among sites within those ecoregions. But this percent of variation, this high variance, suggests that there's a lot of plant-to-plant -plant variation within a site, which argues for collecting from large populations um, and large number of individuals to maximize evolutionary potential. And finally, which was pretty cool, is that when we looked at uh, um, this multivariate technique for separating, for looking at similarity, where in individuals are, that are similar are close together, this actually separated the individuals into their ecoregions, uh, into the Sandhills, the South Atlantic, and the Middle Atlantic Coastal Plains. And again, this is a really small geographic region. So we are, we do see differences in Tephrosia populations in our garden. We do see differences in genetic structure, and um, this really argues for being careful about where we take seeds and plant material from. Limitations to this study are it's geographically narrow. It's not going to provide any good answers to big-time seed producers who want to make one or two or three seed sources for long time restoration. But in general, we did find there's evidence of Geographic variation in some of the functional traits. I'm not sure if it's adapted yet. Um, we have to look at our between garden comparisons to draw that conclusion. We're just getting to that point. Um, we really need more um, extensive geographic range if we're going to be able to um, make recommendations or build range-wide seed zones, which is our long-term, our sort of our goal, to put a provisional map out there for saying you should move seeds no further than this than this. And in these instances, environmental variation is different. That's another thing we're looking at. We do have environmental data from where the populations were sourced. And there's good reason to believe in short, in 
in perennials, in herbaceous perennials, that they are diverse, that those environmental ecotypes matter. And I think there's evidence for in Aristida stricta and work that's been done, Aristida varicana and work that's been done in the past that flatwoods um, varieties are different from sandhills varieties. And I, I think we'll find that in a lot of species. Um, we do know that the genetic variations are also related to geography. Uh, using the methods that we use, there is the potential to actually link gene, gene loci or gen, genes to particular, tr particular traits and particular form, performance. And that ultimately will help us screen populations for is it suitable to move this plant from here to here. And that's a, kind of a long-term goal and it's hard to get to. But there is increasing success in that, and methods are making that more and more possible. We're trying to expand um, our sampling to performance in different locations, trying to better understand the differences in species, like are the composites different from legumes, different from um, uh, grasses, for example. Are there differences? Can we use these differences to inform seed zone development? And this is all based on data analysis. And then we will evaluate the utility of proposed seed models. And if, for, if nothing else, it at least gives us a chance to say, no, you're wrong. That model may work in the West. It doesn't work in the Southeast. And we need to go here to get there. Um, so I think in the future, we will narrow our focus to a fewer species, but expand the focus in terms of geographic range. So I'd like to just stop here and acknowledge um, thanks to our partners. It was a big, it is a big project. We're just now gleaning information which will help us. We have a direction for the future. We had, uh, most of these folks helped with collections. Some of them helped with uh, seed cleaning and uh, Clemson University provided resources and local garden staff. So that's the story that I'm working on now. Do you have any questions? Mind yes. Oh, there is uh, about seeding. Did you get good seeding without the burning? Obviously, it's in this garden. I'm so glad you asked that. We did. Yeah. Um, we had three years of these plants have been producing seed for three years. Now, I actually haven't tested the viability of the seed. So that is, I was thinking about that on the way down, because just this year is the first year that every year, every population produced flowers and seeds without burning until this year. And this year there are some populations that did not produce flowers and seeds, whereas other ones did. It seems to be a population-related phenomenon. So um, I, I do want to, we have some seed collections, and I do want to look at the viability of the seeds. But there may actually be a real difference in the, the require requirement for northern and southern wiregrass, which is a really interesting question. Um, a long time ago, Ron Myers um, predicted that there was a difference. Now, I'm not sure what his logic was, but he says, if there's a real difference, it's going to be, you know, I said one of them would need it and one of them didn't. So that's a really good question. And we got seed production. And when I planted wiregrass in other places, too, we got seed production, at least in young plants where resources were limiting. Um, for a couple of years. Is that your experience? Well, well we, I don't have any right now. We've been, myself and my colleague who came with me today, we've done some, we call it Johnny Apple seeding, but we don't do Perfect. it, we don't do adult gardening, but we yeah. just try and, and, and see what happens, and we'll go back and, and check some areas. And we do have a small garden um, at work, but we not the type of garden that you have. It's just more of a wildfire garden. We throw some stuff in there and we see, like, by actress and see what will yeah. come up. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Do you burn it? The garden? The no. no, not the garden. It's too close to the building, but I, I'll burn the building. Yeah. <laughs> Carolina Santos, when I worked down there a long time ago, they had their, their old building was a brick building. So we convinced them as some graduate students, and we had this harebrained idea that we would put a native garden like right in front of it. And they let us do it, and they burned it too. It was brick, so I guess there was less risk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was really quite lovely. Yeah. I think it was a question. Um, I was wondering if you did any pre-monitoring prior to the harvest, so that you know when you talk about extrapolating this to um, a more practical scale for restoration practitioners, mm -hmm. the impacts of the harvesting of local seed from local native areas on 
the native areas themselves? Or did you base your harvest intensity or methods on or some established study? Our seed collection methods, we intentionally chose large populations. So, and they had, that was defined as a minimum of 200 plants. But most of them were way bigger than that. I like, if we were collecting 50 plants from 200 plants, that's 25% of the population. And so most of our plant our populations were way bigger than that. So it was a little amorphous. The, the selection of 50 plants distributed across the population has been published in various other studies, not as necessarily southeastern studies, but oh, 50 seems like a good number. But when you get down to it, it's pretty arbitrary. And we did not look at the impact of seed harvest, but again, we weren't collecting huge amounts of seed. I would think that um, over time, if you were doing that repeated collections using, and we did, we did all hand collections too, right. so our impacts were pretty small. But I do understand that problem, that question. Yeah, if you're looking to make it on a sort of a landscape scale, you know, to be restoration efforts in a major way, would you still recommend local seed source? Um, no, um, that's that was like one of the, the argument or one of the not necessarily. I think one would have to consider what's at stake, what's at risk by by compositing seed from different sources. Now, because we've seen variation from site to site, if we were trying to make collections for a large restoration project. I would still go to the largest nearby populations, and I would see. I would keep the seed separate, just because we don't really know. And I, because the monitoring is really important, and I would take the opportunity to say, okay, this whole this whole five acres is going to be from this site. The seed came from here, and the seed came from here. And if down the line you see they all perform similarly, great. Uh, mix them all up and and have at it. Um, so I, I see where using multiple sources is valuable and necessary for large projects. Um, and my conservative response would be to keep where you plant them separate, at least until you determine if there's differences in, in how they perform on your research. And I mean, another consideration is, is there wire grass or already there? So are you at risk of swamping out local genotypes by bringing in something else? And that would be, um, then I would be more inclined to, to go slowly and add really local seed and to, to increase it. But I don't know. I, I get tor torn up with one of my pet peeves, and I, I just wrestle with this all the time, is the need for restoration is so important and so widespread. And I, I ask myself, how, how right do you have to get it? Mm -hmm. just, just, just practically, just going out and doing it most of the time seems to be the important thing to me. Um, and how do you decide whether you actually need to seed, for instance? Like, yeah. how to assess the native seed bank? Well, that's, that's, a, that's one of those whole sets of questions that were recognized by um, uh, the paper that was just published. And, and the very first question is, do you need seed? you need to add seed. And um, if you have the luxury of time, put some seeds in a, in a flat, put some soil in a flat and see what comes up. But I think that's also one of the really interesting unknown questions about the laundry system. So many people have reported that, oh, I went into this site, it looked horrible, it had duck this thick, it hadn't been burned forever, I went in, I clear cut it, I planted a log lolly, a log leaf, I burn it, and, and stuff was there. And, and we don't, we didn't see it. There's no, but was it there? So how the long term, how these populations or species persist, persist over the long term, I think is not well known. There is potential for below ground crop yields that we just can't see. Root, rootstock, um, that when given resources, um, I don't think we know very well. We do know, there's been quite a few seed bank studies. There may be a transient seed bank. So wiregrass seed may be on the ground for a year or two if you don't burn it. There's no long-term seed bank. I mean, I would, no study has shown convincingly that there's any long-term seed bank that you can rely on for restoration. Um, if it's been, if, 
there was native plants there recently, or if there are native plants on the edges. There's a lot of wind dispersed things that you can get establishment and recruitment, but I, I, I am really curious. Um, I used to just say, when people told me those stories about, it's a miracle, you know, everything is here. I said, no, nah, you just missed it before you burned it. But the stories have been repeated and repeated, so I, I am interested in this long-term persistence in the cryptic way. Yeah, just one small thought on that. I think sometimes with wire grass, it can just be maybe a couple blades mm -hmm. are there, so in terms of missing it option it's it's there but it's very just barely hanging on yeah and it's hard to see yeah. I've, I've seen that for other species too which was my reaction was oh it was there you just missed it because i got pretty good at identifying those single strands of thing. but I, I still, i'm not ready to discount now i used to think i know knew that but i don't anymore <laughs> and just one more for the garden itself um did you use any fertilization to increase flower production and seed production? No. no. But that raises another that sort of keep learning. But in particular in the Sand Hills Garden, the nutrients, it's deep sands, it's pretty low nutrient. Mm -hmm. I, I think that fabric helps to retain some of that moisture and, and um, which is is important in those sites. But I'm not sure that Solidago, for example, <coughs> uses lots of flowers. And it produces what looks like seeds, but I'm not sure those seeds are viable. I'm not sure that the maternal plant has the resources to produce viable seeds for solidago. And we're going to look at viability this year because last year we collected solidago seeds, and I looked at it and I thought, oh wow, look at all these seeds. And then I, I pulled up a collection of seeds that we had made from another location a long time ago, and the seeds were like ten times heavier. I thought, wow, oh, what's going on? So I just said, oh, we collected them too late. You know, this is just the stuff that never developed into seeds. So we've been really careful this year about the time of the collections. They look just the same. So I've been reading about that. And I'm, I'm wondering if for that particular species, maternal resources are not sufficient. But the other ones, the other species seem to have enough. The seeds look like real seeds. <laughs> I'm going to try to partner up with the seed lab again and have them do some x-ray analysis. But that's a really good question. I, I wouldn't fertilize any of them. This is the first year when we put them in the ground. Uh, well, we fertilized them once in the greenhouse to get them grow because there was those sterile media. There was really nothing in it. And then the only plants we put the legumes, the tephrosia and the lespedes in the ground, and we had to baby them to get them started. So my poor technician at the time, I, you know, we put them in the ground. I said, Brian, these are horrible. I said, you have to go down tomorrow and give them this dilute fertilizer and, and water each of them by hand, hundreds of plants. He did it, it was great. But those were my, but I think that was important in early establishment. Um, but once they get going, you know they're nitrogen fixers, and if, they, if the ladies can get going, they should help themselves. I was curious about that when you're starting the seeds, and I'm wondering about the lagoons especially, um, about mycorrhizal associations in the soil. And Oh, when you said you had a sterile medium, mm -hmm. and we didn't sterilize the seeds, but we also did not inoculate the microbes. And, and what was the land use of the gardens? Uh, gardens had in the past been in, they were in pasture grasses, I think. It had, but where we planted in all of those sites had been fallow for a couple of years before that. But as I mentioned, we didn't plow it. We just tried to control the weeds with. We burned them first and then covered them with um, landscape fabric. So this year at the Carolina Sand Hills Garden, which is the garden we've had for four years, um, the plants, I don't, we, we took soil samples um, two years ago and I want to repeat the samples at the Carolina Sand Hills because I do think the nutrients may be getting depleted. I think there may have been some residual nutrients when we started. Um, it, it's a possibility. Uh, the other possibility, well, the reason, I, all the plants were smaller this year, but the weather was really, really early wet spring, really dry season, really hot. It could have been, could, you know, I was talking with uh, the local manager down there, and, and they have a power line with native plants in it, and even in their power line, the plants are smaller, so I'm guessing it's probably not nutrients, but I'll check that. It's just, your, your variation in size. 
it, we haven't seen a lot of mortality, though we do see the occasional mortality of established plants, which is pretty rare. Um, but we do see it. So I'm interested to see if we, did, if we do continue to see plants die and if there's any prediction of which ones. So maybe there's a longevity gene that we need to be looking at. You have a question? Yeah, and there's some different variable. I was just curious if um, many studies have been done um, logging activity in the long required grass ecosystem and something like what season it was logged is how it affects the, the wire grass. Um, not so much, I don't know about the question of season. What I can say about that, though, is the following. A long time ago, the world was young, you know, I did a study that looked at the seasonality of drum chopping and burning. So drum chopping is a disturbance. It's used in, in forestry activities. So what it has in common is that it's a disturbance. And that dormant season drum chopping was bad for wiregrass. Because I think that uh, the plants were not actively growing and so their roots were exposed for a fairly long time in like March was the dry time in Carolina Sand Hills. So I, we lost plants with dormant season drum chopping. So I think what's really critical about the survival of bunch grasses with soil disturbance is two things. One is the intensity of the disturbance. So if you're ripping it out of the ground, you're going to lose plants where the ripping happens. But a lot of forestry activities are localized and patchy. So it's not likely, unless you're doing intensive site prep, that you will take everything out. So the intensity matters. And the conditions after that disturbance matter. If, you, if that disturbance is followed by rain, um, and it's much like planting long leaf. It's followed by rain and you get this root growth establishment. Same thing for wiregrass and, and the perennials. That if, it's, if you do it at a time when it's sort of the beginning of a rainy season or rain is predictable, uh, I think you're in pretty good shape. And I'll, I'll just give you another little side story um, that I, I've been changing my mind about seasonality uh, for a couple of reasons. I was asked to do to look at the translocation of Harper's Bee, which is an endangered plant on the roadside in Highway 65 in the Appalachian Coal National Forest. The flowers in May or early spring. And the question was, if we need to rescue these plants from the roadside, do we know how to do that? Does season matter? Does how big a plant do you dig and move matter? What's the right habitat? So I looked at the question of seasonality, and I was sure if you move these things in June, they were going to up and die because it's just too dry. It's too hot. Dang, you know, they did great. They were actively growing. They had enough rain. We dug up these cores, picked, took them and moved into a completely different site. And it was those conditions afterwards that we had like 99% survival in the move. And, and it was at least, it was in the growth of those transplants exceeded the growth of plants that were transplanted in the dormant season because they were just slow to start. So I, I am so rethinking my thoughts about um, this timing of disturbance. And it's just a little aside thing, but it's it's the same pattern for wiregrass and I think established perennials that as long as you're not ripping them up completely and you get reasonable non healing conditions afterwards, you're going to get a lot of survival. And the plants are really amazingly tough. Uh, well, another side story. We, when we dismantled one of our gardens, we, you know, we have a personal relationship, a lot of investment with all these plants. We knew their number, we knew their names, we knew their parents. You know, it's, so here we were going to be ripping them out. So we said, oh, let's turn this into a plant rescue public education event. So we had a workshop down near Florence at the PD Research and Education Center, in which we pr provided a half a day sort of introduction to the value of the ecosystem, 
what our plants were in the garden and why they were in the garden, what they meant, and also their value to pollinators. So this was a sort of a pollinator workshop too, and it was to encourage uh, private landowners, private gardeners, public landowners as well were invited to the afternoon event was uh, rescuing plants from our gardens. <laughs> and uh, we hadn't really dug up any of these plants. Um, Tephrosia. Okay, Tephrosia had been in the ground for two years, I believe, at two, after two, three growing seasons. <coughs> we started, you know, the plants when they're at their peak are probably, you know, less than a meter, about a meter in diameter. Pretty big plants, they were beautiful plants. So, to put a spade in the ground. We ended up, bushel baskets didn't, didn't <laughs> harvest the, the below ground biomass of those plants. So there's a lot, unless that disturbance is really deep and broad and intense, there's a lot of ways probably. One of my, one of the technicians who worked for me, Kate, who doesn't have as so much of a green thumb, she couldn't help with that rescue. But we brought her a bushel basket sized approach. It was her only request. I don't know how long it sat, her, sat in her yard. I don't know where it was in the yard. I know it was in the shade. She planted it, by golly, it flowered. You know, so these, these plants are just amazing. And it is still living. It wasn't just this freak of that. So I think they're amazingly tolerant once established. And that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question about, but it's the general question is, that's also a good segue into our next talk. Do we want to forego the break or just push back? Okay, so we'll take a break, but maybe we'll make it a 10-minute break instead of 15. So let's all please be responsible and back in your seat by 10 till. And that way we can get going and somewhat stay on track. Thank you. And of course, Dr. Walker will be here for the rest of the day.